Thank you very much. It's, uh, thank you for the invitation. It's very nice to be here. Uh, I'm supposed to, to give a mini course, and this is really a, a, a mini course because only, I, I guess I have only four hours. So uh, um, it's uh, so anyway. I decided to speak about polynomials on polydisks, and uh, this is then basically uh, lectures about function theory on polydisks. So. We are in. <coughs> so the basic object is then the polydes disk, uh, which sometimes I guess I will write n instead of d, and uh, the distinguished boundary of the polydisk, which is T d. Uh, so I, I will speak about uh, several things relate <coughs> related to. Uh, recent research of mine, but I will also try to uh, to, to uh, show you some old results which I, deserve, uh, I think deserve to be to be better known. Um, so sort of the common feature of, of uh, what I will say is that uh, the inspiration here is sort of not the one-dimensional case but really the infinite dimensional case. So, so d in equals infinity is sort of more an inspiration than d equals 1, is, which is sort of the, uh, let's say, the traditional uh, approach. Uh, there is also a common feature here, and that is that there, there are re relations to, to, to other fields, as you will see. And inspiration comes uh, at least uh, very much uh, at the end of the lectures from number theory. So anyway, let's, uh, today I, I'm, I was planning to speak about uh, what is known as weak factorization, and, uh, and this is a problem of, uh, that was uh, considered by, by Helsen, and in fact it was Helsen's last paper, Helsen died in, Henry Helsen died in 2009, and his very last paper, which was published in 2010, is about this problem. So l let's go back to, to one dimension. Let's start with one dimension. So if you have a function f in uh, h1 of the disk, then we know that this function can be written as a Blaschke product times a function without zeros, right? And therefore, we can write f as b f square root times f square root. And this function we can call h, uh, g, and this we can call h. So we have a very nice factorization of functions in H1, uh, these two functions would ha will have the property that uh, the H2 norm squared will equal the norm of the function itself that we started with. Uh, that's an a one norm, sorry, H1. So this stands for H1 norm, this for H2 norm. Uh, why is this? Well, this is very nice, but it's also quite important because it is another way of phrasing this result is uh, something called Nehari's theorem. Uh, so uh, let's go to Nehari's theorem, which is uh, can be is a statement about <coughs> Hunkel forms. So, given some function psi uh, on the circle, we define h psi, hopefully, from h2 uh, cross h2 by h psi of f g should be the inner product between the product of the two functions with 
this given psi. So this is the inner product on on uh, for H two, which is just L two on the on the circle. Please stop me if I should say uh, give more details, but I, I guess that everyone here knows about H two spaces. So. Uh, Okay, uh, and uh, wh when is this actually a uh, 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 form that gives you some something? Well, when is this a bounded form? That's the the the, the uh, what Nahari tells us. So Nahari's theorem, which goes back to the fifties, says that says that uh, H psi is bounded. <coughs> If and only if psi uh, defines or represents, perhaps we should say, <coughs> uh, bounded linear operator, uh, linear functional, sorry. On H one, and this linear operator is the obvious thing. Let's call it L psi, uh, which is just f against psi, like that. Uh, well, I mean. Um, and how do, how do we prove this? Well, in one direction, it is absolutely obvious because we uh, we uh, uh, put in here a product which, since I have a product of two functions in H two, it must be in H one, right? So so the sufficiency of this is obvious. The necessity follows from this uh, factorization. So it's a, an immediate consequence of that factorization. If I now plug in. Uh, uh, an h1 function here, and I, I factorize it. Well, then I'm looking at the uh, at, at the Hunkel form, and then using the boundedness of the Hunkel form, I get that this has uh, it must be a linear functional bounded linear functional on h1, and we all also get that the uh, that the norms of the two things are the same. This is pre-BMO. Nehari is pre-BMO. So of course now we can say that well it has to be a function in, in BMO and so on. But uh, but uh, Nehari stated it in a slightly different way, and of course the, the statement makes sense uh, independently of what we know about linear functionals on H1. Now uh, this gives us a hint that the right thing to what is the right thing to ask <coughs> in the polydisc about factorization because factorization in this way that is too much to hope for i mean you cannot expect that you can factor out factor a function in in uh, in several variables in this way with a blushka product and so on this is nothing not not possible so but but uh, if we look at what nahari uh, tells us we may be happy with something less uh, uh, s s something which is not quite factorization, but something which is called weak factorization. So to establish Nahari, and Nahari in the sense that you can associate uncle forms with bounded linear functionals on H1, uh, on the polydisc, it suffices. To have that, you can write h your function in uh, h1 as an infinite sum of um, products f j g j in h2. With control of norms, in other words, with f 
for some constant c. Like that. If you have that, then you can prove the Hardy's theorem, theorem in exactly the same way. Sufficiency is obvious. Necessity, well, you take your h, represented in this way, apply the Hunkel form to each sum, uh, to each term in the sum. You see that it must be a bounded uh, linear functional, and and since you have this. Uh, property of the norm, you will at the end point uh, get the L1 norm or the H1 norm of, uh, of your uh, function H that you plugged in. So it has to be a, a bounded linear functional on, uh, on uh, H1. Uh, so let's now assume that we can do this and I mean that we can write H in this way and let's define the weak factorization norm of H as the inf over all possible representations of our functions function in this way of the of these uh, <coughs> of these uh, sums. Uh, now there is a very impressive and quite difficult theorem by, by uh, Lacey and uh, Ferguson, or I should probably say Ferguson Lacey. And then later, Lacey and Terwilliger. Well, there are two papers. The first one is uh, for d equals 2, and the second one is d larger than 2. And it says that we have weak or let's say h1 of d d admits weak factorization i will not prove this theorem it is quite difficult and uh, I, I think i would need more than the, these lectures to prove this theorem what I will do is to give you some very concrete examples of how to uh, actually do this factorization. Uh, what Helsen was interested in uh, was to extend this to uh, d equals infinity. So in order to do that, you need to have control of the, the norms, or, the, or the, in particular this, this c, uh, when the dimension grows. Uh, so, the, sort of as a, uh, in order to deal with this, it's very good to have some very concrete examples. And that's what I will look at now. So, in particular, one could ask, well, this is fine, but what is the weak, what is the best factorization, weak factorization of a given polynomial? So, can we find? the best weak factorization. Say for some polynomials. Well, to do it for all polynomials would be hard, but let's say for, for at least some polynomials. And the result I would like to uh, discuss now is a very, very concrete example, um, namely, let's see, where am I? Yeah, 
uh, let's, so I will prove the following theorem. Let's introduce the following polynomial. Let's d be even, okay? Then I can uh, take a product like this. Let's just take a product of uh, these linear uh, polynomials in, uh, but I have different variables everywhere. Okay, so this is a homogeneous polynomial of degree d over two. And the theorem I would like to prove is much simpler than, than the one there, but it gives some additional information this is a, a theorem that I proved with uh, Ortega said there. The weak factorization norm of this polynomial, guess what? It is the L2 norm. which means that actually the best thing to do is to do nothing, right? No factorization. The best factorization we can do is just to take f or the polynomial times one. That's exactly what this statement is. So some, somehow the, uh, the notion of weak factorization is extremely weak. We do nothing. How do we prove this? Um, at this point, well, first of all, we can certain things we can do immediately, like computing the L2 norm, right? So this is uh, uh, something that is very easy because the the, the uh, variables. Um, separate nicely uh, since we have this product. So the uh, L2 norm of each factor <coughs> is square root of 2. So it's square root of 2 uh, uh, d over 2 times. So it means uh, 2 d over 4. That's the uh, L2 norm. Okay, that's fine. Uh, but how do we deal with, with the norm on this side? Well, Um, the thing to do here is to, to bring in the Hunkel form. So, uh, um, see, sh should I use this or uh, what is the best way to? Hmm? As you want. As I want. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> well, I can. I still have some uh, some left uh, some, some space here. Yeah, right. So uh, the idea is uh, to introduce a, a good uh, Hunkel form. So uh, if I have a if I have a Hunkel form, then uh, I have two. Um, yeah, I have two uh, things here. If I take my polynomial. against some psi, which I call a symbol, then this is less than or equal to the norm of the form times, if I put in the, uh, uh, some uh, weak factorization, which is on the top there, into the form, what I will get is here the weak factorization norm of uh, of my polynomial, just plugging uh, this thing into the Hunkel form. Now, if I'm so clever, 
So this gives me a, a bond from below if I'm, uh, if I'm clever. And if I'm so clever that I manage to get this bond equal to, th to this number, then I'm done because I know that uh, it must be at, at least be the uh, L2 norm. Okay, so that's, uh, that's what I want. Now, uh, which psi should I use? Well, clearly I would do a, probably do a good job if I choose psi to be equals to, uh, equal to PD, right? Because then I shouldn't lose anything. So let's try. Psi equals PD. Um, then uh, the left-hand side is, again, very easy to compute because that's the, just the square of the L2 norm. So then So the question is if I can manage to say something about the norm. And uh, it turns out that you can use a very uh, non-sophisticated idea, which is still powerful. And that is something which is called the Schur test. to uh, estimate uh, this idea of using the Schur test comes from Helsen. He had had the uh, this wonderful, very simple idea. Um, now, if uh, if you, I will tell you what the Schur test concretely does for us in this situation. Well, let's see, the theorem should be kept, I guess. What's uh, I can, okay. Well, then I will do that. Uh, but that is without water, right? So I, sh so I now I need to use this uh, this one. Well, since I started with water, I guess I should. No, that th that was not so. <laughs> Maybe I should put it on. Or I could let it dry and do a... Okay. I will use that one afterwards. Okay, so uh, the short test, yeah. Um, the short test we should use when uh, uh, we should have the the, the Lahankel form now on matrix form, so we should produce, uh, we should translate uh, the, the, this Lahankel form into the language of matrices. Okay, so now in order to do that, I probably <coughs> need to, or it's useful at least, to write functions um, with multi-index notation. So uh, Z. So alpha is a multi-index. In fact, it could go to in infinity, but since we are in uh, dimension D, let's stop there. And then Z to the alpha is Z1, alpha 1, and so on. So then we can write functions as A alpha Z to the alpha. And the product of two functions will be a, let's say, beta b mu. Well, the function g has uh, 
coefficients b alpha. Uh, so beta plus mu is equal to alpha, like that. And if the form or the uh, symbol has a representation with coefficient c alpha, taking in the product with psi produce well, uh, we can forget about, we can assume that it is analytic, so that, uh, in fact, all of these are positive. Then the form. becomes C alpha B beta plus mu equals alpha A beta B mu, which we can write instead as sum over all betas, sum over all mu's, A B, uh, A, uh, let's see, A beta B mu C alpha uh, beta plus mu. So that's how the matrix, the matrix form of this uh, uh, uncle form is. And uh, how can we, and what is the short test? You probably have seen the short test, but short test. Suppose you can are able, we can find a sequence P alpha such that C alpha uh, C beta plus mu p beta is less than constant c times uh, p uh, here we sum over beta and here comes mu suppose that we can do that then our form, well, I, I guess I should continue somewhere, maybe here. Then, uh, well, actually, I can do it here. Then the norm of the form is bounded by this constant C. The proof is cauchy schwarz uh, so Maybe I should can do it. So what you do is you, you look at uh, the sum B mu over mu and let, let this be positive. I should probably have made it positive to begin with, but let the P's be positive. So we multiply by P mu and we divide by P mu, so one half minus one half, and then we do Cauchy Schwartz. So we get let's square it. Um, yeah, we should have the C in both places. Uh, well, it's we should probably have uh, absolute values on. Yeah, as, let's have absolute values here. This is positive. So I mean, the, the, the short test is something very unsophisticated because you can put in absolute values as much as you like. Uh, so and then. 
here we have, uh, and then with um, p mu minus one, and here you have c alpha plus beta. Uh, well, I did something. Yeah, beta plus mu uh, p mu. Now you may uh, you use the assumption on uh, on our uh, p, so you get the constant here. This should be squared. Sorry for that. Then uh, I think it should be okay. And then p uh, mu inverse, and then p uh, beta uh, like that. Now you go back to uh, the form and uh, and take a Cauchy Schwarz on uh, also with the a. Uh, then you uh, can can put this uh, p beta with the uh, with the c there. And then, uh, and then, uh, the finally, you you uh, cancel this one after you have done it with the a two. So that's how it goes. And you get c squared, and, and taking square root, you get c. Okay, so that's that's the short test. And now, the, so the only question about the, when you use the short test is to be clever and find this p in the right way. And uh, what should p be? Well, first of all, uh, it suffices to take p mu. Oops. P mu different from zero only when mu is less than. And I will explain what I mean by this, uh, by uh, less than uh, alpha. Uh, for which, for some alpha such that C alpha is different from zero because Otherwise, uh, this this will be zero, and uh, and we don't have to do anything. So we only need to take a finite sequence if we remember uh, that we have, in fact, a very special uh, symbol here, namely a finite. Uh, we have a polynomial with a finite number of terms. Okay. So um, now, how? What are the? So by this. I just mean that each uh, each uh, entry in the uh, multi-index is smaller than the entry here. So this this is an entry-wise inequality. Okay. So which are the uh, c alphas which are different from zero in our case? Remember, psi is this special uh, uh, symbol. So C alpha different from zero means uh, now notation becomes a little bit uh, becomes a little bit um, uh, challenging, um, but uh, hopefully the the idea is, is simple. So remember, uh, hopefully yes, here is our uh, uh, um, polynomial. So from each factor, we get a contribution from um, from both these uh, from both these um, variables. But they they don't uh, they, so they they will not appear in the same term. So this means that it will be something of, of the form well the two first either zero or one. Okay, not they cannot both be one. They cannot both be zero because each each one of them will appear in each term. So it will be zero one, then perhaps uh, one zero, and so on. So we will have pairs, uh, pairs like this. Or well, maybe zero uh, one at the, uh, where we have one zero and one one in in some order. Is it clear? Okay, so that means 
that I, I can allow similarly only uh, sub uh, when I, I choose my PMU I should just take a, uh, some um, index which uh, will have either one or zero uh, in some of these and otherwise zero. That's all I can allow. So what I will do is to choose uh, P mu to be 2 to the minus um, 2 to the minus the absolute value of mu divided by <coughs> 2 I divide by 2 absolute value that is now just counting how many non-zeros I have because I have only each time I have something I have one so it's the number of non-zero uh, I mean in general it will just be the sum of the entries in the multi-index but in this case it, it's just the number of places here where I have something non-zero I have one okay so let's now so what uh, remains for us is to see the action of the matrix uh, which we had somewhere which is this uh, this one on on this sequence. So let's see what that is. Or should I continue? Maybe I can continue here. C uh, beta plus mu p mu. And I sum over all mu's. What is this? Okay, so, uh, well, first of all, I obviously get, uh, yeah, when I have fixed my beta here, what does it mean? It means that I have fixed the number of pairs where I'm not allowed to, uh, to, put, uh, to put something. So it means that here I will place uh, ones or zeros in in um, how many places to, um, d over two uh, yeah d over two minus uh, mu places uh, uh, I'm sorry minus beta places so it means that the the value of this guy will for each one of these. For, for, for each one in this sum will be 2 raised to the power d over 2 minus uh, beta. I hope I got that right. At this point it gets... Um, yeah, that's right. Okay, so that's, that's what these guys contribute contributes uh, with and then the, the question is how many terms is it in this sum? Well the number of terms will be uh, determined by by this beta. I mean if I have uh, if I have uh, if this is zero I get everything. If it is the whole thing then I get nothing. I get only one term. So, so what I will get is and I have a pair for each of them so I will get two raised to the power um, let's see now if I manage to get it right um, D I have to think twice um, it says here now wait a second I probably got it wrong because what I did here uh, was to count the number of terms. Sorry, here is the. N <laughs> it's, it's easy to get mess, uh, messed up here. This is the number of terms. I, I'm really sorry, and the number of and, and the value of the of, of this guy. You have to help me to see if I got it right now. This is the value of the of the thing. D. I forgot that I should divide by two and take a minus. Yes. Um, yeah, this one. Take a minus one half. So. It is d over 2 minus uh, beta and then divide by 2. 
I'm sorry. This is the value of P. This is the number of terms. And this is just because these are the number of, of uh, free spaces when, when I have fixed beta. So this is the number of free, free entries. I can put ones and zeros in. And this is the, the total number of, again, a number of, of spaces or entries where I can put something. OK, so if I now just uh, sum the uh, exponents, I get two. Uh, what do I get? I get 2 uh, d over 4. And I get uh, min minus uh, modulus beta there, and plus beta over 2 there. So I get, in fact, this number with a beta. So I get p uh, beta. So the C in, in the Schur test is 2 to the D over 4, and that's exactly what I wanted to have. Now it was is lost, but I, I compute it. I can write it again, because this is quite, um, <coughs> yeah, let me write it here. So the basic uh, relation that gave us the estimate was that PD in the product with psi is less than or equal to the norm times the weak factorization norm I have computed from before that this is precisely 2 to the d over 2 and now I have found that this is less than or equal to 2 to the d over 4. So uh, I have then an estimate from below for the weak, fa weak factorization norm. d over 2 minus d over 4 is d over 4. So then I get what I wanted to have. There is another thing which is very nice here, and that is that, uh, okay, this gives me an estimate for, well, it gives me precisely the weak factorization norm. So if I now go back and plug in here the exact value of the weak factorization norm, I also get the precise value of this guy, which is perhaps a bit surprising that this rough thing with the Schur test, in fact, enables me to compute the norm. Because, OK, let's, let's forget, forget this. And remember that our computation shows, or in fact, our theorem tells us that this is equal to this. Right? So it means that the norm is bounded also from below by 2 to the d over 4. So the Schur test gave us the bound from the other side, and this gives us the bound from the, up, uh, from, from the uh, left side. So a corollary, which we can state here, What else do we get from this? Well, we can say that surely we cannot hope to have anything uh, when we go to uh, infinite dimensions. Because uh, if we also consider what the uh, corresponding norm for the linear functional is, we got some we get something a discrepancy here which uh, grows exponentially. Well, let me explain. Um, oh, 
the combination of first the wet and this one, I think, was a was a bad one. <laughs> okay, so we know exactly what the norm of the Hunkel form is um, concerning the uh, linear functional. Acting now on a function in H1, well, that is, of course, uh, if we take the absolute value, this is obviously, by definition, uh, the norm uh, in H1 times uh, the norm of the function. The norm in H1, well, since it's such an explicit and simple uh, polynomial, we can compute it. Okay, so P, or I should probably put PD here. Well, it is just a computation on the unit circle because we can pull out one of the variables and just uh, consider one variable. So it will be uh, an, an, an integral of this form, 1 plus e to the i theta d theta over 2 pi raised to the power d over 2, uh, which you don't want me to do, probably. Uh, but I can tell you that it is 4 over pi d over 2, like that. So we will then have an estimate from below of, of uh, this L psi. And this gives. that L psi, and perhaps we should divide now by the norm of the Hunkel form, which we know, um, it will be uh, in fact pi squared over 8 raised to the power d over 4. And since pi squared is larger than 8, this is uh, something which grows exponentially. Of course, uh, the moment I started, uh, I knew I could compute the L1 norm. I knew the result would be like that, because for each individual factor, the L1 norm is, is uh, is smaller than the L2 norm, so it had to be that way. Uh, otherwise, I would have done something wrong with my computation. So it's not so miraculous with the pi squared here. So uh, let's take now just a, 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 a look at what uh, I, I mentioned Helsen, and I want to tell you what Helsen was up to. Uh, in order to do that, let me go back to the Hunkel form. As I wrote it as a matrix, uh, Uh, like this, so uh, A alpha, well, maybe I don't remember uh, my notation anymore, but I guess it was something like this. And then it comes here C alpha plus beta. Uh, what Helsen does is to represent it in a somewhat different way. Namely, if we now think of uh, the indices here as integers, so we, we write an integer like, uh, we, we just write the prime factorization of an integer. So we take the sequence of integers and raise it to the multi-index. So it has just the same meaning as before. So P1, alpha 1, and so on, up to, let's say, we have D uh, entries in this multi-index, so something like this. Of course, this could. This, here I, I could allow uh, any length of the uh, multi-index. So if we do that, then you see that what appears here is just a product of two integers. 
So another way of writing it, and then um, it, it is something much neater. We can write it as, so we may write, So you see then it looks much more like the good old uh, one-dimensional Hunkel uh, matrices, except that now we multiply M and N instead of uh, summing them, which we do with, with, uh, on, on the unit circle. So this is, uh, uh, this is Helsen's definition of a Hunkel uh, form on the infinite torus. Actually, we don't have to speak about the infinite torus at all. We can just speak about sequences A n and B n and uh, introduce a form given a, another sequence CM and, and introduce a form in this way with this rule. So uh, that led, so that led, uh, in fact, Helson to a number theoretic problem. So his idea was, which I have, uh, we, we have uh, uh, used, uh, is to look at the suitable um, Uncle form, and his choice, Helson's choice, was <coughs> to put a uh, j equals one for j up to some capital N, and then zero otherwise. Well, let's say cj. Uh, which gives rise to a very interesting Hunkel form. But the trouble is that uh, what we actually do in this way is to mix number theory into our problem, which it's not about. I mean, the problem is not about number theory, but it gives you an interesting number theoretic problem. So let me just explain. Uh, so the uh, nat a natural way, once we have uh, chosen uh, a symbol like this is to, to represent uh, these uh, functions, not as functions on the polydisc, but as uh, directly polynomials. So let's write um, well, psi of s cn like that. And in fact, now everything um, yeah, let's see what did I want to say? Yeah, we can do everything as basically as uh, before with this guy, and we can, for instance, prove for even for more general uh, polynomials. I mean this is a, this is certainly a polynomial, but we call it a directly polynomial. It can be made into a polynomial on the on the uh, polydisc again by using the same rule. So we, I mean, we get set j by just putting pj to the minus s, and then we can go back to the uh, polydisc. <coughs> Brings us back to p. So uh, we can use play the same game, and we can prove, or Helson proves. Not he doesn't state it explicitly, but it follows from his argument that Helson proved well. Maybe I should. <coughs> call, by the way, let me call it D N because it's we can think of it as the Dirichlet kernel. Let's call it D N. Helson proved that the weak factorization norm of this fellow is bounded by 2 times the L2 norm. So in other words, we're not, not absolutely sure that the best thing to do is to do nothing, but we're pretty close if we do nothing. So again, for a host, and, and we can do this for more general classes of polynomials. So in fact, uh, this notion of uh, factorization is somehow deceptive in this situation. The best thing to do is to do nothing. 
But the trouble for Helsen was that, well, everything worked fine in, until, until a certain point. Namely, in order to find the discrepancy between the norm of the functional <coughs> and of the form, we need to compute the L1 norm of the polynomial. And this is not so easy in this case. So we need to compute or estimate And Helsen worked for a long time on proving a conjecture saying that uh, the norm, and you can just think of it as the norm we get when we move back to the, to the um, unit, uh, to, to the polydisc. Uh, that this uh, is little o of square root of n when n tends to infinity. That would have given uh, also the result that you cannot uh, use, have, you don't have weak factorization on the infinite dimensional uh, polydisc. Uh, it looks rather uh, plausible, right? Because square root of n. <coughs> That's the L2 norm. So we're just saying that the, uh, well, asymptotically, the uh, L1 norm should be a little smaller. Um, but it's not so easy. And, and, and this is definitely where the number theory comes in. So that's why I, I said what I said, that what Helsen did was to mix number theory into this, uh, into this problem. But uh, it would be very nice if someone could do this. <laughs> um, so, um, maybe at this point I could um, tell you, since I, since I uh, did, since I did um, introduce this uh, Dirichlet polynomial, uh, note that I, I don't, it, it, it doesn't help you to, to solve the problem, but at least it's, it's good to know uh, that we can also compute this norm uh, in the following way. Lim t goes to infinity, 1 over 2t, mm, so let's say 0 to t, uh, d of i t, uh, d t. In fact, uh, more generally, we have that if you take any, any, uh, let's see, where should I write it? Yeah, let me write it here. More generally, if f of s is a uh, then lemma and now I probably have some trouble with my notation I'm lazy so I I write just like this by this it means that I go back to the the uh, Unit to, to the polydisc with this transformation and computes the norm on the on the polydisc. This uh, uh, to the power p is equal to the limit uh, one over t. Why why did I put two there? Sorry, it should just be t because I decided to start at zero. Well, uh, this probably, uh, you, if you know the ergodic theorem, you can prove it using the ergodic theorem. So it's, 
it's uh, it's a sort of a, it's an ergodic result. But I thought I'd, I'd just give you a down-to-earth, very simple proof of it, uh, which is the following. Proof. For p equals 2, this is a triviality because uh, you can just multiply. I mean, I'm dealing with a finite sum here. I can just multiply the things and observe that I'm do dealing with exponentials. So when, when I integrate from 0 to t, uh, I get something finite for the, uh, for the uh, um, uh, exponentials. And since I divide by t and t goes to infinity, it will go to zero. So it's trivial uh, for p equals two. And thus, I can just repeat, and I, I can apply it to uh, any power of f, and then uh, raise it to the power two. So in other words, it's trivial also for p equals to two k, k equals one, two and so on. And then, once I've done that, in general, approximate the function x maps to x to the uh, power p over 2 for x in the interval from 0 to ma the maximum of our, of our um, f squared by polynomials. In other words, what I'm doing is I'm using Weierstrass approximation theorem. Uh, I don't want to do the I don't want to do the rest of the details, but uh, uh, it's an, a simple exercise now to finish the proof for a general piece. So this is a very down-to-earth, simple proof that that uh, the norms are the same when for all p's. Uh, okay, so. Uh, this is hard, I think. Uh, let me show you something that we can do. We, so this is, can be viewed uh, one way to view it is that it's a statement about the relation between the norm and the sum of the coefficients, because what I have here is the sum of the coefficients. So, <coughs> so we can interpret Helson's conjecture. as a statement about relation between uh, L1 norm <coughs> of coefficients. And L one norm of polynomial. It's quite interesting that if we change uh, the uh, L one norm here into an infinity norm, we get something uh, very precise and quite remarkable. So uh, if we replace L1 norm 
multiply our infinity norm, we get the following theorem. S of n, by definition, is a soup overall, and here I take the sum And of course, the a n should be not all be zero. Otherwise, it's not interesting. So let's say a different from zero. And then the infinity norm of this guy. And uh, of course, uh, well, let's write it like this. By which I mean, I, I take the infinity norm on the uh, imaginary axis. So t is a real number here. So I take the maximum of this thing. Uh, there's a supernorm of this thing when t ranges over all real numbers. This number behaves asymptotically as square root of n. This is what you uh, get if you take Cauchy-Schwarz. I mean, if you take Cauchy-Schwarz here, uh, you, of course, get that it is uh, less than the square root of the number of terms times the L2 norm, and the L2 norm is uh, dominated by the L infinity norm. But you don't get that, of course. You get something uh, which, surprisingly, perhaps, is smaller. So you get, maybe I should write this on the next line because, yeah, well, I can try to squeeze it in. Well, probably, probably I should write it here. So the square root of n, and then it's an exponential minus 1 over square root of 2, plus something little o of 1, and then comes uh, log n, and then comes log log n. Uh, and this this result uh, is <coughs> uh, has a many uh, there are many ingredients in the proof of this, and there are many people that have been involved in proving it. Uh, let me just mention uh, some important. I should probably have mentioned Bohr, Heidel Bohr, because he had this basic idea of moving from Dirichlet series to the polydisc. So that that's sort of goes a hundred years back. But if we uh, if we go to modern times, then uh, you have Konyagin and Kefalek. who proved something like this, but with not with precise constants. In two thousand one, then you have uh, Dola Brutesh proved the sharp uh, lower bound and and uh, and then I was involved in the final piece uh, uh, giving the upper bound in the paper with uh, the font Frederick Onai uh, Ortega said There is a lot going into this proof, and, and one of the things I like uh, about it, I, I'm not able to tell you how important this result is in itself, but what, one of the things that is, that is very nice is that it combines a lot. I mean, you have a, 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 a serious amount of uh, number theory, mostly represented by the lab Bretesh. There are uh, sort of standard uh, uh, probabilistic techniques going into it, and then you have uh, uh, quite a bit of uh, function theory on the polydisc. So I, I thought I would uh, say a few words about the ingredients and uh, emphasize the stuff uh, concerning um, polynomials on the polydisc. So uh, my plan now is to give you a rather simple uh, argument showing that uh, we should have a lower bound like this uh, I mean, Sn bounded from below by something like this, except I won't catch the sharp constant. Okay, so I will 
show the uh, bound from below with one instead of one over square root of two. So in other words, I will get a, a smaller number here when I put one uh, for the bound from below. Okay, so that uh, brings me to uh, a very nice construction uh, that uh, I think it's good to know about uh, of so-called Rudin-Shapiro polynomials. Rudin-Shapiro polynomials go back to the 50s uh, to uh, constructions by Walter Rudin, of course, and uh, Harold Shapiro. Uh, and they are, they are used quite a bit in applications. Um, so anyway, uh, I should probably also say that what I'm doing now, I, I have taken from a, a paper by Maurizi and Kepler Lake. From 2000 and uh, 10. Well, this, this first thing about Rudin Shapiro polynomials is old stuff from the 50s. Anyway, so let's, let's do it first on the circle. So we take a matrix. I call it A1. This matrix is 1, 1, 1, minus 1. It's called an Adamar matrix. Uh, uh, why do I pick this matrix? I pick this matrix because it has the good property that if, if I square it, or if you like, I take A1 star times A1. What is this? Well, the rows and the columns are orthogonal. So I get two times <coughs> the identity matrix. OK, so this is my, 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 my one of my, or the, the basic uh, tool for the construction. Now I wanted to produce a sequence of polynomials on the unit circle, or on the unit disk. So I, I do the following. I put P0 <coughs> equals Q0 identically 1. And then I start a recursion. I uh, require that uh, in, the, in step P, J plus 1, uh, I produce two new polynomials, which I write as a vector in R2 by applying the matrix A1 to the previous Pj. But here I introduce uh, Z to a power 2 to the J times Qj. Well. I can g tell you explicitly what these are to begin with. These were the, in the zero step. In the next step, P1 will be what? Well, I should, uh, I have one plus Z, and that's it. Okay, and then uh, Q2 uh, is uh, one minus Z. And uh, well, I can do one more, and then I think I stop. P2 is 1 plus z, that's what's p, p1. And then I, I will have z squared times uh, 1 minus z, so that means plus z squared minus z third, and so on. OK, uh, what will I have in general? The degree of p j is the same as the degree of qj, and that must be 2 to the j plus 1 minus 1, right? Uh, let's see, did I get that right? p degree is 2 to the j uh, minus 1. Sorry, sorry. Uh, this is not plus 1 there, minus 1, like that. Then it's okay. Okay, and moreover, how many uh, terms will there be uh, with 
and with 2 to the j plus 1 terms. Well, probably I should uh, try to squeeze everything in here. I've doubled the number of terms in each step. Okay. Okay, so uh, number of terms. It is 2 to the j plus 1. And coefficients. Well, they will be plus minus 1. Because I, since I have a, 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 a power of z here, which is larger than the uh, uh, degree of, of the polynomials I put in, I, I, I get that the uh, that the uh, terms don't start uh, mixing, right? So I will always keep. Uh, I just double the number of terms and keep my and will get plus or minus one depending on. Of the matrix uh, operates. Uh, what is interesting about these polynomials? Well, if we take a look at PJ Well, and look at, uh, at pj, qj simply as a vector in R2. Uh, remember, I started with a, uh, with a vector which was 1, 1. It has length 2, or square root of 2. So this, this sum is 2 uh, in the zero step. When I apply the matrix, remember, it has this property that is, uh, when I square it, I get uh, 2 times the identity. I just, I just um, uh, multiply each time by 2. So when I have done this j times, it becomes 2 to the j plus, two, plus 1. So uh, <coughs> this is a quite remarkable and nice property of these polynomials. Um, by the way, I, I probably got it wrong with the uh, L2 norm because I, I was, uh, it's this right. Uh, the number of terms is 2 to the to the j, sorry. I mean, uh, I, I got it wrong here, sorry, 2 to the j. Okay, uh, what can I th then say? I can say that the infinity norm of the matrix from here, I get uh, that the infinity norm, obviously of, let's say, pj, obviously is bounded by uh, the square root of uh, the infinity norm of this, which is uh, the square root of this. So it's less than or equal to 2 to the j plus 1 over 2. But since the number of terms is precisely 2 to the j and the coefficients are plus minus 1, this is precisely square root of 2 times the 2 norm. So it says that the Rudin Shapiro polynomial is uh, almost flat in the sense that the L2 norm and the L infinity norm are almost the same. Kahan tells us that we can do better, but uh, still this is quite good and useful. So I should probably add that Kahan has some, and, and other people, uh, there, are, there, are recent, there is recent work by, by Bombieri and Bourga giving a more precise information about more complicated polynomials. Uh, but uh, but anyway, this this uh, this is uh, as I said, still quite useful. And uh, now let's see what we can do to get something in higher dimensions. And. Uh, the idea is then to in involve more uh, involved matri matrices. No, so not so much more, but let's uh, uh, take a sequence. So now I'm in, in several variables.
So let's take a sequence of matri matrices um, <coughs> by requiring that in step uh, k from when I go from k uh, to k plus one, I define my matrix to be a k a k a k minus a k. So in other words, I plug in blocks in the same way as I did to begin with here. Uh, and of course, A1 is just this matrix. If I do that, this, then AK is a 2 to the K times 2 to the K matrix. And it has similarly the property that AK squared is 2 to the k uh, identity. So each time, well, this is something you can sit down and, and check. So, um, so what Konyagin and uh, or Mabretsi and, and Konyagin does is the following. They say, okay, um, let's now choose a parameter for our construction. Yeah, I can follow. I'm going to continue here, which is Q. Choose Q simply two to the k. Okay, just so that we don't have to write two to the k every time, and then uh, we start in a similar way, except the only difference is that instead of taking a, a two vector, we <coughs> take a, a q vector. Okay, so we choose p0, uh, zero, 1 up to p0, zero, q. q polynomials, which are just one, all of them. All of them are one. Okay. Well, next time it becomes more interesting because what we do is in the jth step, we have pj1 up to pjq, which, of course, as you could guess, is obtained by multiplying a K by what? Well, we want, don't want these uh, terms to start mixing, so we want to separate them. And the way we separate them is that we introduce each time new variables. So we take Z. Uh, how, f how far did we get? Uh, well, let me write plus one here. Sorry, plus one. And plus one. Uh, well, if let let me write the variable here first, and then <coughs> I. So let me see. It will be J Q plus one, and then comes uh, P J uh, one, and then Z J Q plus Q here. P J Q. So uh, it looks perhaps complicated, but uh, what I'm doing is just I have a big uh, bucket of variables, and uh, I just mechanically put a new variables each time I do this, and I, I take new variables in each step of the iteration. So to get the number of variables involved, I just count the number here. And then I multiply with the number of steps I have uh, gone. So, thus, uh, uh, similar properties as we had here. I probably forgot. No, they are there still. Thus, PJ, 
let's say one, because we will only use one of them, uh, is a, uh, is a pol homogeneous polynomial. Each term is of the same degree, homogeneous. of degree equals j, because I just uh, add one degree each time. And uh, moreover, uh, coefficients – well, I should take the number of coefficients. How many coefficients will there be? Well, there must be 2 to the jk, I suppose, if I'm not mistaken. Isn't that right? 2 to the jk uh, coefficients. Each equals plus or minus 1. And of course, since I have this property of the Adamar matrix, I also get that Pj1 squared plus Pjq squared is precisely 2. Uh, now remember, I have k, k here, and I, I do it j times. So I will get 2 to the k, which is actually 2 to the k was uh, q, as we defined it. So it will be q raised to the power j plus 1. Uh, let's see if I got it, got it right. Um, I yeah. K, k hmm? I could... K is yeah, so it's Q to the J. You know. <laughs> well, it's dangerous this with Q, of course. It's supposed to help, but Q to the uh, J plus 1, yes. <coughs> okay, now uh, that is already all we need to uh, produce something that can uh, give us this lower bound, except that we don't catch 1 over square root of 2. Is it too late? No. <laughs> I mean, you <laughs> you may be tired. I mean, okay. So uh, let's uh, have a bit, uh, a s very very small piece of number theory here. It's almost nothing, but uh, if you're not too tired. <laughs> so, uh, what we will do is to have a homogeneous polynomial. That means uh, that in each term here, in each n, there should be a fixed number of primes involved, uh, or a, a, a fixed number of prime factors, I should say. And I will uh, do it in, in the way I, I did here. So in fact, what I said was correct. Uh, I will only have one, uh, one um, power, uh, power one, uh, for each prime involved. Okay, so I, I simply want to have a polynomial of this uh, kind, which I have just constructed. So that means uh, I should first try to figure out if I've given my n, um, how many primes can I involve in this uh, construction. <coughs> so n equals uh, for some reason, let's stop at. Uh, I, I use yeah, I used m uh, in my uh, notes here. I probably should try to use m now. So m times q. So m is the number of uh, iterations or uh, I make. Q is uh, as before two to the k. That corresponds. number of variables uh, 
Okay, and then, uh, and we just make a rough estimate here. If I have, uh, if I have some given prime, then I should have the power of this. I, I forget that I had different power, uh, primes in each uh, term here. I just take, the, say, the largest prime. Uh, this raised to the power m. This should, of course, not exceed uh, the largest possible integer. So this should be less than or equal to the capital N. OK, so uh, let me use the uh, notation of the prime number theorem. It means I'm looking at an x raised to the power m. This should be equal to n. OK, then the prime number theorem tells me that m q, which is the n, a number of primes involved, is uh, this function pi of x. And we know from the prime number theorem that the number of primes less than or equal to x is x over log x, 1 plus little o of 1. x it was this, so it is <coughs> n 1 over m. Uh, let's me, yeah, 1 over m. And then 1 over m comes out, and I have log n. And uh, I'm almost tempted to say that this is 1, but let's keep it like that. So this is, uh, this is my n in the construction, the number, the, the number of variables. And in fact, you see what I get since m appears here and appears here, here I get that q 2 to the k. Should I, of, course, of course, I forget completely that it's not clear that I, uh, I, I choose n so that I can get it to be 2 to the k. So let's just assume we can do that. Then we get n of raised to the power 1 over m divided by log n, and then this additional stuff. OK, so that's my Q. And now, actually, I'm almost there. So don't, don't worry. I'm almost there. S of n. I should keep this, because this is what I will use. <coughs> S of n is now larger than or equal to. OK, so what is the number of terms? Well, I already said that, that it's q to the m. So uh, remember how it was defined. Number of terms, all of them are have modulus 1. So that's q to the m. And let's see, there is something. Now, oh, let's see, why, why did I get, what, where was my infinity norm? Yeah, uh, sorry, I, I have my infinity norm probably somewhere. Yeah, here it is. So I take uh, m plus 1 over 2, yeah. So that will be q to the m plus 1 over 2, right, like that. So this is equal to q or raised to the power m, no, I think I got it right, minus 1 over 2, right. OK. This, then I've just plugged in my polynomial, constructed in this way. <coughs> and now I have here that this is, uh, well, when I take m over 2, I remember I, divide, I have uh, m in the denominator there. I get my square root of n. Very good. Uh, but, of course, I also have a logarithm. And I ha have a minus uh, 1 over 2. So I will get, in addition, uh, n to the minus 1 over 2m and my logarithm. 
raised to the power um, minus m minus 1 over 2. Uh, like that, and then the additional stuff with, which I now skip since it's so late. One plus little o one. Okay, so the question is now the additional stuff, which should correspond to the uh, exponential factor. What comes? What, what do we get for that? Uh, this is a calculus. Uh, this is a problem in calculus. So we'll just find the best m which I didn't choose, by the way, I forgot that, to say that so far I have not decided what m should be. But now I decided, I decide that I want m such that this becomes as small as possible. So calculus, a calculus argument. Argument which you gives that the best we can do choice for M is square root of log n over log and now of course you can sit down quietly and check that okay if I put this in here I get in fact this thing except I get 1 instead of 1 over square root of 2 You can see that you have log n there, you know, and then you have 1 over 2m there. Well, you have uh, this square root of log n will go into the denominator and, you know, things, things work, uh, they, they, they uh, become what they should become. Okay, so that's very nice, uh, but of course we uh, lost a lot on our way because we skipped uh, choosing this particular um, polynomial, <coughs> we of course uh, uh, skipped many, many terms that we could have had. So we could have looked at a more complicated polynomial to estimate it from below, and that's exactly what De La Bretèche does. And he uses two additional things. He uses uh, this Salm Zygmunt uh, estimate uh, or uh, uh, technique, uh, which is a way of um, constructing it probabilistically. So that's one piece, and the other piece is a more serious amount of number theory here. I only use the uh, prime number theorem, but you can use more uh, powerful estimates from, from, from number theory, and then you get this one over square root of two. Okay, so uh, I guess my main idea uh, here simply was to uh, show you um, this Rudin Shapiro um, construction and uh, to see what it can be used to and uh, it, I think it's a very nice it's a very nice construction so what I, I, I will stop now and tomorrow I will speak about one other ingredient which goes into the proof of this which is something called the Bonobluss Hill inequality and then I will speak about something completely different uh, where, uh, again, it's about polynomials, but uh, uh, the topic will then be, uh, again, number theory, but perhaps more directly number theory, namely something which I call greatest common divisor sums, and their relation actually with Poisson integrals on the, on the polydisc. So that's what we, uh, will happen tomorrow. Thank you.